So, welcome to the Perspective Podcast. We have Nick Black over here, an absolute fucking warrior. I'm so excited for you guys to meet him. He's going to introduce himself, get a little background about who he is. I'm telling you guys, he is resilient. So let's go. Let's listen to his story. Just open up. Let's start. Let's start with your passion. Let's start with your passion. I love it. Well, my passion is lacrosse, yes. the game of lacrosse. It's an interesting journey, for sure. Um, it started my junior year in high school. Starting out just getting ready for baseball, getting ready for that spring season, but being curious for my friends who were just getting on the turf, shooting around, getting ready for their lacrosse season. One day it just took me getting out there saying, hey guys, let me try this. Let me shoot around. As I continued to do that, it was one day where there was a group of seniors on the lacrosse team that were just in the distance about 40 yards away. And they'd see me start shooting around, and all I'd hear were those little chirps, those little crickets. Little just, chirps. Just laughs and just the mocks and the, oh, and, you know, Black, stick to football. Like, you're no lacrosse player. Like, oh, look at him. Like, he's, look at that shooting form. For me, through all of my childhood, and I think the way I've experienced both of my father figures in my life, I took that, internalized it, and they didn't see an ounce of emotion or or, or response. Mm. I continued to play, but in my mind, I went home that day thinking, I need to play lacrosse. Mm. Fuck baseball. (laughs) Mom, can you help me get signed up for lacrosse in the next two weeks? That moment sparked a drive of resentment, revenge, the ability to prove somebody wrong that set me on a decade course of just a relentless effort to develop this craft. Mm. And that was just one moment amongst many that I felt, but that moment in particular set me on a path where, okay, let's pick up lacrosse. Let's try it in two weeks. Between those two weeks, I reached out to my buddy who was on the varsity team. I'm like, Hey dude, we got to like, you got to help me. Like, I need to prep. Like, I, let's go over the basics. Every day, it was a diligent effort to get better. Mm-hmm. Every single day. Went to sleep thinking about lacrosse. W- woke up, obviously, grabbing my stick. And before school or after school, just like, All right, I need to get out to the turf. And still seeing those same people that were chirping me in the back, just seeing it. But what they did start to see was somebody coming out every single day. Mm-hmm. So going into the season... That then led me to an opportunity to play varsity because the head coach saw, oh, he's a big athletic football player. Let's give him a go. It was very apparent in the opening, you know, stick skill drills, like, whoa, his stick skills are not there, especially compared to the other varsity team. So we need to put him on JV. It's only fine. Still love the game. Just wanted to play. Hmm. And as, again, practice led up, we, that led to our first game. Um... I'll never forget that shift of me taking my first shot, me blowing by some sophomore because I was more athletic and much faster, but my shot was 10 yards above the goal. Pretty sure hit the baseball backstop at at Hall High School. And all I see in the corner in here are those same group of kids and our head coach saying, oh, Black, you should have stuck to football. Oh, that was brutal. Like, look at that. Again, internalized it. Said, all right, got it. It was every moment after that, again, just those few moments. Something they probably forgot the next day. But I held on to that, internalized it, and focused such a diligent effort, and I'm going to fucking get good at this. Mm. I'm going to really get good at this. That then led into the end of the JV season. Still loved the game, but going into my senior year, I wasn't able to play senior year lacrosse due to too many concussions from my high school football season. I was able to play tennis, which was great. I found an incredible coach in our varsity coach, Coach Solomon. Shout out Coach Saul. Coach Saul. Coach Saul, baby. (laughs) This guy was the exact sort of role model and father figure I needed at the time as well. Somebody who played the game and loved the game with a sense of pure love and passion. Not a sense of, 
winning at any cost or having those negative emotions that may drive an athlete. He just loved the sport. Going into my senior year, I knew that if I couldn't play lacrosse, that's all right. But playing tennis was just as good because I loved the game. I played the fourth spot doubles. I was our last spot on uh, varsity with my partner, Alex Nee. And we just, again, played every match with love and just fun. That's exactly what I needed. And again, talk about a serendipitous moment. Maybe I wasn't supposed to play lacrosse. Maybe it was just the exact moment like, hey, maybe you were supposed to like, get those concussions from football and be, able, un, be, un, be unable to play lacrosse. But now you're able to experience a different sport and a different father figure in your life. You gain a different perception. Different, wow, like life is pretty fun, especially the sport. After my senior year, going into 2011 summer, my buddy Danny Carr from the varsity lacrosse team still knew I had an interest in the game. And he was like, hey, man, I heard about this like club team that's offering a trip. We're going to go to England, going to go to Denmark, going to play their U19 teams. The Olympics are going on in England. Like, we got to go. Like, it will be sick. And again, coming off of that, year of playing tennis of having love and just passion for just sport i still held on to what i was feeling with lacrosse and i'm like let's do it fuck yeah and haggling with my mom like mom i know the bar mitzvah money was supposed to be dedicated to something else, but like i need to go on this trip i need to and you know her probably seeing my passion and, and just my want to get on this trip and, and experience overseas lacrosse and just more lacrosse in general. She said reluctantly, okay, let's do it. It's a nine day trip I'm going to England, playing their U19 team and then going to Denmark and Copenhagen for a couple days. And the month before the trip, preparing every single day, it was with preparing with like, wow, I love this game. I love the idea of every time I pick up the stick and pick up a ball, I may miss it just like I did that first shot 10 yards above it, but I'm getting better. Seeing my progress every single day because of my dedicated effort was what drove me. And so flying overseas, playing in those games, there were plenty of moments. Again, really playing my first competitive games, having so many moments of anxiety like, oh, shit, no, 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 I don't want the ball. Like, Give it to someone else. I wasn't shy away from the physical contact, but I was, I knew, and I was nervous with my stick skills. I was like, I, I can't handle the ball. I can run past these guys, but no way, I can't get checked. Just give the ball. But whatever it was, certain moments in those games inspired me where I had the ball. I was like, let's just try it. Let's go for it. That's the worst that can happen. And scoring my first goal that I'll never forget, just shooting on the run down the alley. Actually, a shot that I still do and, and, and I'm quite good at, or I think it's my bread and butter to this day. It's just funny how like it's progressed 11 years and thinking like, yeah, it's still the first way I scored a goal. I don't think I scored the rest of that trip, but nonetheless, I'll never forget that first goal. <laughs> and coming back from that trip, it was a love for the game that, I, that just took me on a path that I'll never forget. It was falling in love with the journey right then and thinking, all right, I got to make up for lost time because I started this sport late. But I love it. I am obsessed with this sport. Whatever it is that's just drawing, drawing me to this stick, this spiritual connection. And every little moment after that just was a momentous push. Yeah, sometimes there were times where it was a couple steps back. But that vision always remained consistent and it just pushed me further. It's incredible, man. I just, looking back on that time, I'm always curious about, you know, if I gave up if, or if I, you know, fed into that negativity. Oh, you should stick to football. Yeah, fuck you guys. Yeah, I should stick to football. Like, what if? And then on the other end, what was it? What was it that was keeping me just looking at this, hearing that response and thinking, I want this so bad. I just think I'm so happy for those moments. 
I'm so happy for that resentment that I held on to for those individuals because it fueled a fire that I then remained on a six-year path of all of my time was focused on this. I was willing to sacrifice moments with friends and family to, to enhance my craft. And that led into working you know, as a paraprofessional for years, but yet working out at 4.30 every morning and every day playing lacrosse after. I had no other priorities, no other responsibilities. I wanted to work, play lacrosse, and sleep. Yeah, I eat between them. But that's all I wanted. That's all I needed. And still living in Connecticut, not back home, but just in an apartment where, you know, my roommates may have been a little crazy at times, may have been shitty, you know, living environments, whether it was sleeping in my car for a couple of days or just living in a place that's wildly uncomfortable. It never really fazed me because all I cared about was waking up the next day and getting after training. It's all I was focused on. And... Like I said, there's always those bumps in the road. And the major bump I had was in 2017 and having a knee injury that really just put me out and put me at a point where, okay, Nick, you told yourself you love this game. You focused on it for the last six years. You still want to continue? I had every reason to hang up my cleats after a complete knee tear, as many athletes do. They tear their ACLs, their, their knees, Man, I'm good. I'll play at the YMCA in a couple of years. And I had family and friends, uh, my partner at the time, just saying that as well. Saying, hey, maybe you should hang them up. Whatever it was, I knew that no, I need to stay on this path. I have to. It's been too much time that I've dedicated to this. And this is, again, just a bump in the road. It was as difficult to understand during that recovery. I had a few, you know, supporters along the way that allowed me to, you know, see that more clearly, but I knew that I needed to continue. I had to. So, yeah, man. It's fucking legit. Ah, love it. So fucking legit. Yeah, man. So oh. Dedicated, dedicated time to whatever people are passionate about but what i can always say and i just always share this experience with others and saying i i knew whatever i knew i loved this mm -hmm. and when you love something you give everything to it mm. everything can't mm. be delusional can't be oh yeah i worked out a little bit there. yeah i'm good i still love it. no it's an obsessive effort and those those just so we get some clarification those naysayers, you're you're a professional now. You're actually getting paid. Absolutely. To play lacrosse. Yeah. This man is like a definition of, bro. Bro. And, and what's what's a, what I love about that now is what, no matter how big the game check is or how small it is, it's the fact that I still get to play this game at a high level. Whether it's at a professional setting or in a pickup game. Right. I just want to play against the best. I want to push myself to play at the highest level mm -hmm. because I love it. And that's what we do when we love something. We give it everything we've got. And I knew no matter what anyone said, no matter how close they were, whatever they said, that I loved this game and I had to give it everything. Sacrificing numerous moments and, and just things in my life that a lot of people say, oh, Nick, like, why aren't you coming out, dude? Like, why, like, dude, you should be living your life. Dude, I'm living my life. Mm -hmm. This is what I want. Mm -hmm. It's all I needed. And I still operate with that. What I go back to whenever it's a shitty day, whenever it's a long day, or I'm just within my feelings, my stick, I'll always have a connection with. It's a love I'll never, ever, I, I don't think I'll be able to replicate that with anything. Whether a partner, a family member, it's a love that I will always hold on to because it, you know, when I needed that fun as a child playing sport, that's what it brings me back to now. 
I played with the game with so much fun and passion and love that it just makes me feel like a kid. And a kid playing the game with that same intention. And that's the way sports should be played. So. 100%. Yeah, man. So proud of you, bro. Thanks, brother. I Honestly, really appreciate that. Like, Seriously. Not letting like anyone's thoughts determine whether or not you love something. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Like so many people will love something, get some criticism, and then decide to stop loving it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And that's that's how I was for a little bit of time. So I take a lot of inspiration in hearing your story, to be Thanks, quite honest, man. just to seeing how, how you let love flourish. Yeah. That is beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Because for so much time, I, um, I was fueled by resentment. Mm. Fueled by resentment and anger and revenge and wanting to prove people wrong. And at some point, I recognized how deteriorating that was. And I just want to say, like, that is, like, this, just to go, like, it started with resentment, and then it built into love. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. So I don't want anyone who's watching this, if you feel like you're doing something from a negative emotion, you, you, have, you, you are not someone to judge whether or not it's right or wrong. You know what I mean? Because you have no idea where things are leading to. Yeah. You know, so if that's just who you are right now and that's how you're operating, that's 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 who you are. That's how you're operating. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think we can't shy away from that. Right. I think motivation and drive are two different things. And when you find your organic drive that's pushing you towards something, you can't try to transform that into anything else. Mm -hmm. Really understand that. It's an animalistic kind of feeling. Right. Like I'm driven by anger i'm driven by happiness i'm driven by love i'm driven by resentment and revenge mm. whatever it is you can't shy away from that Sweet. and at the time that's exactly what you know how i felt i was driven by revenge and resentment and anger i wanted to prove numerous of people wrong starting with my dad's going into people who are shit talking me mm. going into people who are at a higher level in the game that think oh he's an american there's no way he can excel in this game it's it's moments like that where yeah that resentment fueled me and i needed that but i was tired of it at one point too and i accepted that that drive was needed but it's okay for that to change too right like i just said whatever it is that can change you have to accept that flow right and i started being driven by love and passion and in positivity to be dispersed to everyone and be and find ways to be more selfless. That's where I fell in love with coaching and mentoring and being and working with kids. Because that's what my fulfillment started to come from. <laughs> I was still excelling in the sport. I was still pushing myself every single day. But I was feeling a sense of fulfillment from, wow, now I get to help the younger generation. I get to share my experience. And, and love for the game and also share, yeah, it's okay to feel that those negative emotions. It's all right. Let's tap into that and understand that. I think a lot of young boys and girls just, I think they need more of that kind of role model to, under, to kind of express that whatever those emotions are, reflect, take all your ego and humility, you know, your delusional confidence away and say, okay, let me accept this. Let me get in tune with these emotions. And for young men, I think a lot of those emotions typically are anger, revenge, and, and resentment. But they're confused by it. Maybe mm-hmm. not. Maybe they very much understand, like, oh, no, I'm pissed off at my dad. He was a dick. Yeah, <laughs> I'm pi-, you know? So it could be very clear. But what I think is unclear is how we can transform and direct those emotions into something positive or into something that's fulfilling or towards our mission, whatever it is. Like for me, putting that towards lacrosse wasn't as always positive, but it was fulfilling. That's exactly I needed it. So listening to hip hop that paired with that sense of revenge and resentment, like, yeah, I'm a bad motherfucker. Like, man, I'm going to get through my day. Nobody can stop me. I needed that. And I think some people, I just hope everyone is able to figure out how their operating system. Mm. Yes, we all need love. Everyone should have a sense of love in their life and interact with those around, you know, our close loved ones or strangers with mm. love. Right. But we can't determine how it comes about. Exactly. And let's not determine that those negative emotions are always negative. 
Because mm. I can't say that feeling resentment and anger and revenge were bad. Right. Right. You know, I'm not one to say that. I do understand the idea of stress to the body. You know, our bodies are built to face stress, but at some point compounding stress, especially mentally and emotionally, can be deteriorating. That's fine. And sometimes those negative emotions bring about that stress or keep it internal a lot, you know, resentment and all, you know, those negative type feelings. But maybe it's just having a balance between everything because life isn't always positive. It's not always happy. So let's tap into that dark side. Let's tap into that Bruce Wayne, Batman feeling like I'm in the cave, you know, Mm -hmm. like I see the bad man out there, but also I'm feeling some dark shit inside me as well. Hmm. It's not bad. You know, it just fuels the fire. Just part of your story. But when you truly prepare for a task, an activity, a match, a game, whatever, you know that is true confidence. Like I can go into this, prepare for any outcome, how to adapt in any situation. So at that point, maybe still timid at certain points in the game, but just thinking, oh, I prepared for this. I have my moment. Let me try. So scoring my first goal ever over in that uh, overseas tournament because I didn't score in high school. So that's my first goal. I'll always hold on to that. And then after that, that again was the true momentous step to get me on the ground and go focus on lacrosse. After high school, I went into a AmeriCorps volunteer program called City Year. That was absolutely the right step for me because I think I wasn't mature enough to go into school yet. And it allowed me to move to Boston and work with inner city kids where although I I love lacrosse and it's done so much for me, my true passion is to work and coach uh, kids. Working, especially with inner city kids, specifically kids who may be like me, who are multiracial, have a Mexican origin or or just someone who they never saw picking up a lacrosse stick and and late in high school because they were told, you know, it's too late. Right. That's really my passion is. And, And that first year of volunteering my time, being on, again, like a volunteer stipend, being on food stamps, living with four other people I worked with in elementary middle school. It allowed me to focus on that and that passion mm-hmm. and being able to work with middle school kids that, you know, I'll certainly never forget certain moments with them. Um, working in a second grade class where, you know, I'll never forget the bond I had with those second graders and my teacher that I worked with because of the certain kind of sad moments that we had throughout the year. Mm-hmm. The things you deal with in a normal inner city public school system. Oh, wow. And it was, Yeah. Yeah, that really just started the journey, though. I want to, like, kind of talk about how resentment turned into love. Mm. You know what I mean? That's a big one. That's a big one. How, like, how does that even happen? You know, like, you you, you started the sport. Was it purely out of resentment that you wanted just to commit to it? Was Absolutely. It, it, like, how much, of, how much of the love for the sport was, do you think, intertwined with, it, like, starting to play? I think I started to feel this, frankly, like a spiritual connection. To, mm-hmm. the, to the stick, to every time I picked up the ball, mm-hmm. I started to feel that, but I couldn't own in on it that early. Mm-hmm. But it was. It was there. It, you just were, it, wasn't aware. Yeah. And, and I didn't, re- I really wasn't thinking about it clear headed. But in a way, what f- really drove me was that resentment huh. and that ability to hear somebody say something and say, no, I'm going to prove you wrong. Mm. And that's totally okay with me. Because what we were just about to talk about is that resentment turning into love. Yeah. That internalized resentment allowed me to discover this love. So through that, I'm just using my own experiences like, wow, like I can actually turn that negative into a positive. I can turn all this resentment I've built up over things that those those guys will never remember saying. Mm -hmm. But turned it into I discovered a love for not only this game, but myself. That's beautiful. I Truly. Thanks, man. So, like, you're out here, you know, like that first year going to the schools, bouncing off walls, bounce the ball off walls. Yeah. Uh, you know, continuing to practice on your own time. And that's just purely resentment filled. Yeah. Like fueled. It, it, and I knew that I had to dedicate a certain amount of time every day, if not more, than the kids who are at that varsity spot because of how long they've been playing the game. 
sort of that kind of Kobe Bryant mindset of, of compounding time throughout a day yeah. of training, of, of skill focus and, and, you know, owning it on that craft that I had, I knew I had to make up for lost time. So when you're like using this resentment as fuel and you're going in, you're using like, you know, you're practicing day in, day out. Was it just like one day it just became love yeah. or, or is it like, it's just kind of like, uh, they're just both intertwined. Like it, it Love's there, but re- resentment is still there. Like, how does that work? It, it turned into the love for the process initially, because what I love about any craft, especially any sport, is that you, when you really prepare and you work on it, you see your game start to develop. Hmm. So when I'm going out to practice six months later on my own time and seeing, wow, I'm stinging that corner and that goal much better than I was able to six months ago. I'm doing it consistently. I'm now getting creative with that shot. But, oh, wow, I'm shooting now 10 miles per hour faster than I was before. I was falling in love with that and mm-hmm. seeing that. Uh, playing, my God, I played at some point, I played in pickup games four times a week because it was anywhere from living in Connecticut to driving around Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York. Mm-hmm. Uh, it ranged to eight-hour drives, but I did whatever it took to play pick up every week because I knew again I need to play I need to put these skills to the test just like I did in Europe like all right I'm going to find my moments that I'm uncomfortable but I'm also going to find my moments where I need to go for it that's incredible so that's what I fell in love with and then I think the love really developed when I I discovered a more of a spiritual connection to the game playing with Native Americans and playing with natives especially upstate New York in the Onondaga area where Historically, the game was established, was given from the creator to the Onondaga people and the Haudenosaunee people. Understanding that the game meant so much more than my resentment in myself Mm -hmm. also really allowed me to discover that love. I think it allowed me to, wow, like look past myself and say, Nick, like this sport is bigger than anything, you know, in your life right now. Right. It's bigger than what you could comprehend any other sport being like. There's a spiritual, historical connection to this game every time you pick up your stick that you need to have a sense of appreciation and gratitude. Mm. Not resentment. Not negativity. I gotta say, man, as a huge testament of, like, your character, you know, like, I remember, so we went to the same school, right? And, like, I remember the being, like, whispers. I remember, like, you know, like, hearing it in the air yeah. of, like, people talking shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I remember that. But I also remember, like, I never, I, like, the way I saw it is, like, I didn't even think that you heard about this stuff. Mm. Because, like, I never, like, I never saw a reaction. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't even, like, I thought, like, it was just, like, went over your head or whether you heard it. Like, you were so unfazed. Like, it's not even like I saw you, like, um choosing not to speak on it like or like it, it like it, like sometimes when people are talking smack people don't say up on it but you can still see like their energy's down or some mm. shit you know what i mean or or they'll just like explode and talk about shit but regardless i didn't even like feel like you it was registered at all yeah like i, I felt like you didn't even like hear it and, and i think that was developed uh unfortunately through uh, kind of my relationship with my dad my stepdad mm. because we really had more Jesus, my fault. oh no you're good Apologies on that. <laughs> no worries. Going back, stepdad. Um, yeah. That dynamic really would never was a father-son sort of relationship. It was coach player. Mm-hmm. Like I'm not I don't really see you as as my son. I never felt a sense of love from him. It was always you will focus on soccer, which was my sport. That, How old was he when he came in your life? Um I was about seven. So seven. I was around six, seven when he came into my life. And I think needing a father figure strongly in my life at that point i think it was a sense of trust like i trust you mm-hmm. like this is what it looks like right, right you know right, a relationship right. with the father right 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 we lean into those exactly yeah. no matter what posi- no matter how they act mm. they're in a position yeah so we lean into that authority to, yeah a, a position of vulnerability right they notice and, right and i don't think most father figures maybe i can't you know relate to this but i think most maybe just they don't recognize that magnitude of like a responsibility. Like, That's wow, interesting. you know, I have such a responsibility in this child's life. Yeah. yeah. Everything I say can be, it's absorbed. like gospel. It's absolutely. Yeah. You know, and what that turned into was 
me feeling, okay, this isn't, this is the way that a father should treat his son. And to no, there are certain moments that you have spoke to me, said certain things to me, made me do, you know, extra drills, um, at 7 PM on a school night, yeah. just because I wasn't doing it right. right. Um, but to a point where it was just kind of verbally and mentally abusive. Um, I will never forget the moment where it, enough was enough. I ran home, kind of slammed the door open, and I just ran into my mom's arms, and I just said to her, I was like, I'm never playing the sport again. Which, what was this? This was maybe when I was 11. Soccer? Yeah, soccer. Again, something that I was dedicated to. I loved the sport, and I still do. And I played at a high level, a, pr- a premier level, had some great friends uh, still to this day that played at that level, but... It was always playing for the wrong reasons. It wasn't mm. ever playing for the fun. I think I lost the fun in soccer maybe when I was, maybe the first year I was playing. Mm. Um, but running to my mom that day and saying, I'm never playing this sport again. Him, you know, at some point coming through the door, she sort of embraced me and looking at him saying like, what did you do? Oh, wow. And I think for her, that's when she really understood like, there is something going on. And I'm not seeing, obviously, because it's out on the field. It's out when you guys are practicing. Mm. Wow. And that's when, again, I never touched the soccer ball again after that. Never played. Mm-hmm. And that relationship, it was maybe two years after that they got a divorce due wow. to other things. And, and uh, other things in the relationship, obviously, that weren't working out. But me having no issues with stepping away from that relationship. Right. Me having no qualms about, oh, yeah, you did my wow. mom and sisters wrong as well. No, get out. Damn. Let's get it. So I think similar to, similarly to what I said about lacrosse, just held on to that resentment, but I internalized it. And I think all those moments when he tried to just break me down verbally, mm-hmm. in the last couple of years, I just developed that poker face. Like, I'm hearing everything you're saying, but you won't see an ounce of emotion. Mm. You won't see it. It will be... You know, where you will see it, unfortunately, especially at that time, was me maybe making a dirty tackle, mm-hmm. me elbowing a kid in the face, me being a bit of a kind but of. mostly just going to the school and bouncing off the walls. Absolutely. Fucking practicing. Absolutely. And I think it, I had to really think about that like, all right, these negative emotions, whether it's soccer or lacrosse, were not healthy. Somehow it seemed like you've, you've definitely molded them into a tool, though. Yeah. And then they like they may not be healthy, quote unquote, like but human emotion, like you it, it can be a tool that destroys you or you can leverage it. No. And I feel like you found a way to have emotion fuel you, even if it's quote unquote a negative emotion, anger, whatever it is, like you still it got you out of bed to get to work. Yeah. It wasn't fake motivation. It right. was me again internalizing all these things and yeah, sometimes when people say you wake up on the wrong side of the bed, I woke up always just like remembering what was said, but it drove the shit out of me. Mm. It allowed me to get up at 4.30 a.m. to hit the gym. And because at the time, after graduation and after that, um, or rather graduation, after um, the city year time of my volunteer opportunity, I moved back to Connecticut. Mm-hmm. I worked as a paraprofessional for the following four years after that. You know, trying out, going to school. I went to Dean College, a small liberal arts school in Massachusetts. But after a year, I was like, I'm not, I'm a below average student. I'm still not mature enough to be in school. I need to get out before I rack up this bill of paying <laughs> these student loans back. Smart move. And, and I couldn't. And I even tried to play collegiate lacrosse at the time. I was academically ineligible because what was I focused on? I was focused on partying and playing lacrosse. Mm-hmm. But moving back home, Working as a paraprofessional, not uh, back home with my parents, but I moved all around Connecticut, you know, on my own. But knowing, okay, I, I have to get to work at 7.30 every day. I'm going to hit the gym at 4.15 every day. Let's go. I get out around 3.15, 4 p.m. Oh, I can make this pickup run at 7 p.m. I need to drive an hour and a half. I'm going to hit some traffic at Fairfield, but fuck it. I'm going to get there. So wow. that was what fueled those next four years of working out, playing four to five times a week, still focusing on that because whether I was in a relationship or not, that's a different story because at that point it was sort of a relationship that was a little distant, you know, I was still dating uh, the person I was in high school and that started to become more distant and whatnot. And I wasn't even focused on that. I was mm-hmm. focused on 
across and developing that. Your purpose. My purpose. And what I started to notice as my love. Whether it was voids of love that I wasn't feeling before, that's what was filling it. And that's what was I was giving all of my attention to. As you should. It, absolutely. And it, I loved, and I'll never regret any of those moments. You know, yeah, it's a lot of sacrifice time. Sacrifice time away from friends, family. Mm-hmm. Moments where, hey, Nick, do you want to come out Friday night? Or, you know, hit the bar. I can't. Hitting, hitting the gym at, at 5 a.m insane i i just i was so focused on it and yeah those are the moments where i think certain friendships i was and you know i debated i was like did i miss out on a lot you know and i still have those moments where going out with friends socializing it has its time and place and there's definitely more of a balance of that and prioritization of that in my life now right but understanding that the journey at the time that's what it took Mm -hmm. that dedication Mm -hmm. that full mental absorption and Mm -hmm. insanity of thinking about the game all day Mm -hmm was what I needed. And at that point, I mean, that again led into, I'd get home from pickup and I'd still fall asleep watching lacrosse. It never stopped, Tyler. And (laughs) like we were talking about before, I think the way for me to set a certain bar in this lacrosse journey was, okay, let me try and get to the professional level in indoor lacrosse rather than outdoor, which is the NLL, the National Lacrosse League. That league is very difficult and is very, I mean, there's only a handful of American players. The majority of players are Canadian and native players because they've played the game their whole lives. But for me, it was still a goal. I was like, let me just, let me just set that bar. Like I said, watching games, going to sleep, it led into my dreams of me like visualizing myself running out of the tunnel, you know, me being in Lyle Thompson's shoes, running out of the Georgia swarm tunnel into a thousand fans in front of Buffalo being the rival opponent, just getting booze and just applause. Like, I love that. I may never experience that, especially to that capacity, but I'll never forget those dreams and those moments of that's really what fueled me Hmm. and brought me to a point where I started putting myself in positions to play in a very high level, playing against guys who are actually professional, playing in tournaments or pickup games where to them it was just a pickup game. But I see, oh, shit, I'm playing against this stud guy who's been playing professional lacrosse for six years. You know, I'm playing against my idol, Lyle, and amongst other indoor guys where I'm like, whoa, this isn't a big deal to them. Which is insane. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, and I'll I'll touch on that story uh, in a minute. But having those moments where, again, to them, it's nothing big. To me, it's everything. To me, I've dissected some of those guys' games where to the point where they're like, whoa, it's a little obsessive. Yeah, no shit. It needed to be obsessive. I needed to make up for lost time. And that like fueled that love for this game. How I finally met Lyle was a moment where I was getting ready for this annual tournament in upstate New York called Laxne. I believe it was 2018 was the year. The rink was open at 5 a.m. The tournament, the game started around like 9 or so. Got there around 6.45 thinking I'm going to have the whole arena to myself. And actually, I get there. No one else is there. Start setting everything up. Five minutes later, Lyle and his three brothers show up. With their kids shooting around, doing the same exact thing I was doing because they're playing a game in that tournament as well. Again, to them, nothing big. Something they've done every single day because that arena is in their backyard. But for me, I saw them walk out into that turf, and I said, oh, shit. This is a moment I've dreamt of, I've thought of. All the questions I, that started flooding my head, I wanted to ask them. I had, you know, this little schoolgirl moment where I got turtled up and got excited and got like, <laughs> oh, no, I can't go talk to him. No, I can't. I can't. It's a bad time. And then it just took a little bit of, all right, let me just do it. All right. So I kept shooting around and all I knew, let me just get a shitty shot, like throw it off the board so it had to bounce to the other side of the floor. So I do that. Go over to run to the other side of the floor, and Lyle's there to pick it up. In classic lacrosse terminology, I look at him and put my stick on and go, hey, one more. And he tosses it back. He then looks at me and looks at his brother. He's like, hey, you want to join? Like, you know, we're finishing up too, and, you know, they weren't going to be there for very long. It's like, yeah, no shit. <laughs> I'm going to be right there. I'm going to get my stuff. So stepping in, meeting all of them, Jeremy, Heine, Miles, Lyle, 
and their kids running around. I started now in person seeing them shoot, seeing them play. All the things that I've watched hours of videos dissecting their game. Asking them some questions like, oh, like, oh, hi, can I see your stick? Oh, that's a cool, uh, how do you string that top string? He, he still strings in a certain way and he calls it the Heinz drop top and I still string my sticks to the day with that same like uh, style. It ended maybe 20 minutes later of us just shooting around, getting warmed up. A moment I will never forget. One they've probably forgotten about. But for me, I was like, I just met my role model. Somebody I'm trying to replicate my game around. He was a little standoffish, a little shy, but that's who he was, frankly. And his older brother has just welcomed me with open arms. And I just felt for a moment just part of that group just being like, whoa, you guys don't understand how much I, I appreciate your game and what you've done for the game of lacrosse. Because for those four guys, they are true ambassadors of the sport. Really idol, you know, embodying the, the term grow the game. And I had so much appreciation. I mean, my God, that led into two games later that day where I was just so fired up. I'm like, dude, I just met Lyle. just shot around with him. Not a big deal. You know? And let's go hit the floor, guys. Yeah, I, stay, I still was playing, you know, timid and like a novice level in my indoor game. But I was just like, this is, this was it. Another moment where it just heightened that love for the game. And this time it wasn't resentment. It wasn't negative. It wasn't somebody chirping me. It was somebody who I've seen and idolized their game and how they play the game and the way they carry themselves to me being able to meet them. And I think it was frankly just law of attraction of the me thinking about that person so much, the world just brought us together. And that's what set me up for success for years to come. And it was a year after that tournament, whereas life always tests us, getting ready for that tournament and, and ending that tournament of Lax Day in 2017, I ended up tearing my knee. Mm. Tore my ACL, MCL meniscus. It was the last game of the tournament. Guy sort of stepped on my foot as I was doing, going for a crease dive, and it just buckled. Everything went out. Even worse, I'll never forget this. I think my meniscus wasn't completely torn at the point, but the nice trainer who was not a certified trainer threw on some numbing agent on my leg and during the period and goes, hey, yeah, you should be good. Go out there. Give it a run. And you go out. One sprint or one step off the floor, and my knee buckles again, and you hear the pop. And I'm like, yeah, I'm good. I think I, I can't play. That was tough because that not only was a five hour drive back to Connecticut from upstate New York, just knowing, A, I was driving with my left leg. I knew that something like ligaments were torn in my knee. Calling my mom and, you know, she's making, you know, <laughs> this comment, making a joke. I'll never forget this. Her first thing that she said was, you know, this is why I don't play sports. You know, you, you get hurt, you know. And for her, I don't think she understood the magnitude of the injury, which is totally fine. But I'll just never forget it. It was a little humor to kind of break this path in my head of like knowing exactly what this was. But getting back and going through surgery, or, you know, you go through pre-op. Um, oddly enough, my sister had her wedding um, <laughs> right before my surgery. And I put on my knee brace, hit up the dance floor, and I was like, this is my last hurrah before surgery than being in bed for the next 10 months or projected actually 12 months, 13 months. Being in bed for 12 months? Or not in bed, but recovery. Rather, thank you for clarifying. What sucked was going through that first surgery, developing a septic infection. Still to this day, I'm unsure of how that infection developed. Typically how it happens is something in the OR, something possibly mishandled. There's, it could be, it's numerous of reasons why an infection could be developed. But it happened when I'm sitting back, you know, at home, sitting from that first surgery, and I had this pain that was indescribable hit my knee and my leg where I just was like, I need help. Like, something is going on. And it was the one night where my parents were gone. They were seeing a show at the Bushnell, and I was just, I had no one to reach. Obviously, when you go into a play, your phones are off as well. No one to reach. I'm like, oh, my God, do I call an ambulance? Like, what do I do? All I had was my uh, dog right next to me, my uh, colleague lab, Ovi. 
And so I'm just sitting in pain and withering. And I'm just like, oh my God, what is this? I know something is wrong. And that infection essentially was at the bottom of my patellar tendon and started making its way up my, my leg pretty, pretty rapidly. The reason why we see that is because I went into urgent care the next day or, and then visiting the orthopedist. And the second he drained all the fluid out of my knee, it was just pure bacteria, oh. no blood. And at, once he saw the swelling go down, he's like, I'm going to see you in the OR in the morning. Wow. We have no option. And I could see, A, how pissed off he was, B, how confused he was, and C, how worried. He was like, all right, we got to get in now. So going back in, going in for additional surgeries, and then laying in that hospital bed, still just unsure and just lethargic as you are normally after post-surgery, just like, what is going on? I have these two, I have these three tubes attached to my knee. I have one going through my arm all the way to my heart with antibiotics. And I'm just laying here where Thanksgiving was in like two days. And that's what I was thinking about. I was like, shit, I want to get home for Thanksgiving. <laughs> it ended up being such a dark time that, again, it was me sitting in that hospital bed with my thoughts. And I think allowing all of that resentment maybe past high school, just from my stepfather's relationship, all of that just starting to just come up from being compartmentalized, um, internalized and expressed in different ways in sport, but all just coming up in such a negative way. It was a, a wave of depression that I've never felt before and going to a really dark place. I'll never forget lying in bed just in pain because I think my pain meds wore off at that point. It was in the middle of the night. Um, the nurse at the time, Alex, I'm just like crying out for help. And I'm like, dude, like you just got to help me out somehow. I don't know what it is, but like my leg is killing me. Like my chest, I couldn't like control my breathing. Um, he just calmed me down and just reflected on a moment in his life. where He's like, this is a difficult time, but it will pass. Whatever pain you're feeling physically, emotionally, mentally, this will be, you know, not internalized, but come out in a different way where it will be positive on the other end. And I think that's exactly what I needed to hear when thinking about all those negative feelings that I was building up before. Like, it didn't always come out to be positive. But hearing that, I'm like, oh, shit. Like, this will, on the other end, no matter how difficult it is, this will be a positive. This will work out. So he was a great influence and just that conversation helped. But then what really helped too was getting local support from my uh, childhood rabbi. I believe my mom made a call to him. I, I think she told me she didn't and he just heard through the grapevine. But he came to uh, my hospital bed the next day as well with a gift uh, from the synagogue. He sat down with me and somebody who's known me since I was maybe nine Again, at a time where I needed a father figure, he was a huge figure that I always related to. And one that I always looked at with just admiration and gratitude. And unexpecting him, uh, or not expecting him coming up to my hospital bed and then seeing him, I'm like, whoa, Rabbi, like, what's going on? Then he sat down with me and he started talking, just asking how he was doing, and I just broke down. It was like a moment of just that release that I needed of all those, all those emotions that were just building up. Mm. And he just sat with me, you know, really just allowed me to pour out those just thoughts like, Rabbi, like I'm just at a low. I want to give up. I don't know what's going on. I don't think I can play this game again. My family's telling me I can't. Like, I just need some help, whatever it is, you know. Call up to your boy and ask him to send me some, some sort of sign to help me out. And he said very similarly to what that nurse said to me as well. Like, this is happening for a reason. No matter what you're feeling now, this is happening for a reason. Correct. And again, it was like, wow, I heard this for the second time. That's what my nurse just said. So it started to really settle in. Mm -hmm. And I understood that pain every minor step along that recovery. I mean, to the, the, the point of them pulling those tubes out of my legs, to the point of getting home and hearing, okay, Nick, you have a, you know, estimated three and a half months added to your recovery time. 
because of the antibiotics that you need to be on every day. Um, this infection kind of set you back. I'm like, all right, another setback. That's fine. Good, actually. Because it was just another driving force. But remembering like, this is all happening for a reason. This is building a certain level of discipline and grit, frankly, in my in myself that I think I needed. Right. So those moments when I got home from the hospital and just moving forward, it was every every moment all I could think about was, all right, Nick, let's get this more recovered. Let's take one more step, one more, you know, one percent higher in recovery. Let's bend that knee a little bit more. Let's Oh, you can't move your leg. Let's do some arm and core workouts. Oh my God. Just being in bed and, you know, just doing like band stuff thinking this will help. Maybe just focus on that. What also helped was discovering my love for game of Thrones. It's a time I could catch up on a show or six seasons at the time. I was like, all right, it's a good time. And falling in love with certain characters and their stories as well. And how much they built resentment, and turned it into, you know, their life's passion. It was, I found a lot of similarities. I was like, whoa, this is pretty intense. Like, I'm just watching these characters develop and essentially watching their, you know, they're seeing their family members killed, murdered, and that resentment in them is just being internalized, building in a good way. For example, Arya Stark, the character, had her famous list of people that she just continued to add when they did her wrong or her family. And she always held on to that list. And her driving force of every day was living and getting through those names. Killing them. Taking them out. So I took that and thinking, well, I'm going to make a fucking name. I'm going to make my own list. All the people that said, hey, I couldn't do this. All the people that say, I can't do it. All the people that may be at a higher position and saying and looking down, saying there's no way you're going to excel to this standard, a professional sport, and saying I'm just going to prove you wrong, knocking them off the list. So it may have not always been positive, but again, that's what drove that's what drove me. Yeah. I couldn't shy away from the fact that that negativity and that resentment and that sense of revenge was just driving me you're built different i'm gonna say that right here right now i appreciate that man you know like uh it's astonishing i don't think a lot of people are able to hone the resentment in such a positive way that you have honed it through Mm. you know what i mean like you've really made it into a love type of thing but like bro for like resentment to be so powerful and for you to like really dedicate your life and then just watch it flourish like it's just something that I personally, I, I don't think a lot of people would really c- like relate with, mm. connect with. You know what I mean? I feel yeah. like you're one in a million. You know what I mean? Like people just, a lot of the times I know for me, like I, I would get sometimes maybe discouraged. I don't have, like, I mean, it depends. Like I have some similar stuff too where people doubt me and I like filmmaking and video making. And that's like where my fucking passion is. But just to see like you use your body and just to like really put in that, that work and hone that. That's just different. I appreciate that, man. In a good way. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I also want to say, too, like, I am i don't want to be, like, one of those, like, you know, obviously filter through whatever I say. Make your, like, decision. But at the same time, like, I want you to find fulfillment and peace. Mm. Peace. And yeah. I don't want it just, just to be about one-upping. You know what I mean? But I yeah. could be wrong. So I'm not going to tell you what the fuck to do. You know? Like, you choose. Mm. You know what works for you. Yeah. But as someone, you know, who, who loves you. You know, like I, I want, I don't know what's good. I don't know what's good for you or not. So I'm just yapping. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? No, no, no. But I'm what, just yapping. I, what I love, it's similar to my idea behind workout methods and diets. It like everything will work out for someone. You're just different, bro. That's crazy. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate You're it, just man. fucking different, bro. <laughs> I think it, it took time to really love focus on myself on certain, certain moments in life and just thinking, all right, Nick, like stop feeling sorry for yourself. Yeah. You know, this is again another moment in life. Yeah. But let's let's find that other end. This is some warrior yeah. shit. This is like what we lose. Like we haven't like this is like what men is made of. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and you know what's funny too, Tyler? I what, you wanna know what the song I listen to before every game? No what, what 
Do you remember the movie? I'm, I'm sure you do. Dark Knight Rises. Of course. It's called Gotham's Reckoning, Reckoning by Hans Zimmer. And it's the moment, the opening scene, where Bane, his whole plan is starting to unravel like I was captured purposefully. No one so cared can, who I was until I put on the mask. Exactly that. Was this your plan the whole time? Yes. Of course. Of course. It's such a dope scene. And even the fact that before that plane was just ripped in half, that he even had a soldier, somebody who believed in his cause. Die. Stay behind yeah. in the wreckage. Somebody has to stay behind, brother. And he asked as the fire started. The fire he, rises. The fire rises. And in that moment, again... That is taking somebody from a leadership standpoint, somebody who's so behind that mission. Yeah. I am willing to risk my life. Yeah. I know this is what it's meant to be. Right. And, but that song in particular is dark. You listen to that song with Bo's headphones on before a game and you close your eyes over and over and over again. You start to internalize all those emotions from yeah. years before. And some of my teammates look at me and they've said to me in the locker room, like, Nick, are you okay? <laughs> like, are you like, do you need a break? Like, let's put on some Mary J. Blige. Let's, let's, let's lighten the mood. Mary J. Blige and, in the locker room. Oh man. Well, sometimes you have to, you have to lighten <laughs> the mood, you, you know, to. come on. But I just, for me, I want to be in a place where, again, I am so focused on my emotions Yeah. and understanding I need to, I need this to be. I, I needed to show in certain moments in the game. And I've struggled for years for that to not show in negative ways. Because at times, I've, again, tr through trial and error, felt that resentment build so, just build up so much. That energy and that adrenaline that I go into a game and I end up really hurting somebody. Mm -hmm. Like, it, you know, not just taking a penalty. No, you know, breaking somebody's collarbone. Or like boarding them to the point where they're not moving. Mm. And you have the rest of their teammates meeting you and saying, what the fuck are you doing? And then you recognize, whoa. Like, sometimes that built-up animosity and adrenaline is not good. Or let me figure out how I can really, again, that was too far, Nick. Let's dial it back. Yeah. It's part of, I mean, if you have that power in you, the, like, it's not just to suppress that power. We want to keep on growing. We want to evolve no. with time. You know what I mean? Like, if you have that strength, by you exerting that strength, who's to, like, no, like... If more people exerted that, that strength, I think it would level up our capability as humans. It would raise the evolutionary bar. Like our mm. bodies would be able to take more. Our bodies would be able to do more. You know what I mean? I think we get into this idea of just constant suppression in America and the world. Like we just want to hold back. We want to dial it back. But our bodies are our bodies. We're supposed to like achieve wild ass shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? And we're supposed to, f we're supposed to feel adversity. Maybe not kill people with our bodies. But yeah. You know what I mean? Ultimately, I don't fucking know. No, I do agree with that that concept because, again, I, our bodies, we build them and prime them up to f face adversity. Yes. Physical, mental, and emotional. Right. But, but that's what our bodies are built for. It's, yeah. They're our protective shell to, you know, save our soul and, and, and mind. But, like, our bodies are meant to go. It's the same thing with working out. You're supposed to feel the tension. You're supposed to feel your muscles cramp, not cramping up, but you know what I mean? Like, that burn. Right. Like, whoa, this is a different feeling. It's slightly uncomfortable. Yeah. Mentally, I'm pushing past that. When people, I've always explained that to people, just getting into, especially tra uh, strength training. What I have always, sh like, strive for is, yeah, the progressions throughout my journey are great. Like, yeah, hitting new PRs, being able to move weight faster and, and stronger and smoother is great. But the moment when you finish a set and you look in the mirror and you're like, you're one bad motherfucker. <laughs> I love that. You feel good, yeah, right? That and that's beautiful. that's really that's when I tell me I'm like that's a moment you you can you can't really get in much else in life. Yeah. That feeling of like I am preparing my body for adversity, whatever life is going to throw at me. Right. Right. And and I think that's a concept everyone needs to have. Right. It's not looking like a bodybuilder, but it's having a foundational you know, set of strength throughout your body that you're able to take on adversity. Mm -hmm. obviously not just physically but definitely mentally and emotionally right, right, right. because that builds that confidence of like yeah I'm a bad motherfucker I can take this on right and I also hear like people who work out regularly have a higher pain tolerance yeah you know what I mean so just basically what your body can uh, you know the pain that your body can exude but also or take but also like I'm sure it has reflection of like the mental tolerance yeah what you are able to just like 
handle mentally you're avidly putting yourself through physical pain like what is like our mental when we like stress about shit it's just an idea yeah like, no it's so true you know what i mean it, it really is just an, it's a concept that, again something that we're making up and, right. but it's just an idea like you said but how do we move past that what resiliency do we build in our ourselves day to day when we are faced with these ideas sometimes delusional or not just like right, how do we work past that I think it's kind of like going on to what you mentioned with Kobe earlier before this podcast. Mm. Like for those who obviously you couldn't, you didn't hear it, but what he said is like, he's just focusing on the next step. Mm. You know what yes. I mean? I think it's just the next step, just yeah. the next step. That's the way, that's all we have in life. We yeah. only have this moment right now. You yeah. know what I mean? Like we can only be present right here. We can only be doing what we got. Yeah. We can't think about what we're going to be doing, you know, like five minutes from now, 20 minutes from now. Who knows how much fucking time we have on this. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I could be gone tomorrow. Yeah. Like, we all could be. No, you know? it's so true. So what do we want to... So this is something that I, I would love to bring up to you now and discuss. Yeah. I think at times we always talk about like, what are we passionate about in life? Mm-hmm. You know, what are what motivates us? I think the idea and the question of, you know, what are we willing to go through pain for? Mm. Like, what are we willing to experience pain yeah. for? Yeah. Because sometimes that could be in many ways a romantic love. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. The pain of love with a partner and, and that struggle. Right. It's the pain of maybe financial gain. You're an entrepreneur and, you know, that pain and struggle right. that one goes through because not everyone obviously hits success immediately. Mm-hmm. What are we willing to go through an abundance of pain? Yeah. Like for me, I, I've established a while ago that any pain, physical, mental, and emotional through lacrosse, I'm willing to take on because of how much I love it. Mm. I love it. And I embrace it at this point. Yes, you know, as I'm 30, certain hits to the knees and checks to the shoulders hurt a little bit more. But I'm willing to go through that recovery and say, yeah, I'm willing to take this on because of how much I appreciate this. I love that. And yeah, I just hope for everyone to find that love. You know, that thing they're willing to go through pain for. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, and maybe it is a partner, you know, and I think all long term and successful relationships, there is that pain, mm-hmm. you know. But it's, you know, a sense of compatibility and, uh, you know, that you have with your partner that kind of holds that balance. Mm-hmm. True. And yeah. yeah. Yeah, I feel you. Yeah. Yeah. My thing is, um, is getting into heaven. Mm. <laughs> so that's, what do you mean by that? Like, that's your driving force? My driving force is to get into heaven. Mm. That is, that is my driving force. Because the way I see it is this, this world is always lacking. You know what I mean? I feel like there's always something to be wanted, mm. to be yearned for. Yeah. And uh, I know in heaven, it'll be eternity. Like, think about this. Like, if, if, I, if I put my value in this life, like with all the signs, we know that it comes to an end. We know that it ends. Yeah. You know, but with heaven, there is no end. It's eternity. You know what I mean? So I want to live forever. Mm. You know what I mean? I want to make it into heaven. I want to yeah. have peace. I want to have love. I want to have like beautiful relationships. You know, that's... That's my driving force. And the way I, I discern that is through Christ. You know what mm. I mean? That's how, like, and I know you, not a lot of people will agree with it. That's fine. But it's just how I think. Yeah. You know, like, and I think he put a lot of good um, lessons about how to treat people and how to work through suffering. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, nothing nothing in this world matters to me. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, my relationship with God comes first and foremost. And I God is love. So when I let God love, like live through me, yeah. then I'm loving everybody. I'm loving my yeah. family members. I'm loving my friends. I'm sending them love. I'm building them up. We're, we're growing together, all yeah. of us, you know? I love that. So it doesn't matter to me. Like any type of, no matter what happens, like we're going to die regardless. It's going mm. to happen. So I just want to make sure that I am just loving, that like I show love through it all. Yeah. And that, you know, hope, you know I, give, I give recognition to Christ because that's really the key terms to make it into heaven, apparently. So mm. if heaven if heaven exists, that's where I that's where I live. And well, and what I love about that too is that everyone, internally and you know individually and just without your family and friends, we all need to feel more love. Yeah. Granted, there could just be more love in the world in general. Right. Sometimes but, when you're when you're expressing love, you might not get it back, and you may feel empty. You may yeah. feel like you may get getting attacked for it. You may get angry. You may feel like a like such such a hole in you no. from exper- from expressing love. But um, 
you know, it's 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 the fact that you're actively expressing it, the mm. fact that you're continuing to keep on doing it. Sometimes when you're spread when you're spreading love, you're getting the opposite. Yeah, but it's still so worth it. It is. You know what I mean? It's not about. It's just about spreading love. Yeah, but I think at times, a lot of people can't understand what it does for your internal soul, but it does fulfill it. It does when you truly give somebody love selflessly and without the expectation of something in return. Yeah, whatever is returned you do feel a little bit more right. fulfilled. Right. Um, it's similar to giving somebody a compliment. Like it depends not, on who you are, man. True. You know what I mean? Because yeah. like people are wired differently. Yeah. Like 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 for you when you're in your drive. You know yeah. what I mean? Some people would not be able to hone that. Some people when they express love and they get that negative feedback, they're like they collapse. Mm. And they're like, I'm not doing this ever again. It's not fulfilling. I wanna be I wanna be accepted. Yeah. I wanna, you know, whatever it is, I wanna be on top of the game. You mm. know what I mean? Some people some people just don't it doesn't work with them. So yeah. Some people have good hearts, and some people are just like, nah, fuck that. Yeah. Fuck love. I need to get a one up. I need to get my leg up. I need to leverage some shit. I need to get my build my wealth, build my shit in this world. I need, yeah. that, I need that money. I need that power. I need that influence. Yeah. People are different. I just find those sort of kind of emotions, it's just tiring. No? Yeah. You know, when you are just so, uh, you operate on being feared rather than love like so money hungry. i could have never yeah i think it just it, it's it's a negative energy that you begin to like develop around yourself that there's right. yeah you kind of forget who you are and i think it's short-term thinking because if you're using these emotions hmm. fear and shit like you may get like that immediate gratification or whatever yeah. the fuck you want but when you're 50 60 70 and you have no one yeah like or no purpose or nothing to dedicate that wealth or success to that's a lot of that's a lot of regret a lot of regret yeah it's not something you want to live with and i'm sure you could ask the majority of that age group just that but it's never too late yeah. to turn around you can always even if you're in your 70s your 80s your 90s you can still start showing love right now Absolutely. to people you know you can still start making connections it's okay to 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 confess when you when you haven't done things the best you could have you know what i mean like yeah. We all, we are that, we're all that way. Like yeah. I fall short so many times, you know what I mean? Like so many times. Yeah. No, Recognizing but and expressing it is huge. I do love that, that point though, that it's never too late. Never. You know, it's never too late to show your family members or friends love and appreciation. Random strangers. Random strangers. Absolutely. There's so many people it, to love. There, there are, and there's so many people that need it. And just like I said, um, or anyone has faced, like you just don't know what people are going through right. and when they truly like, wow. I need love, but I'm not showing it any in any way. Like nobody can see that from me. Mm. But fuck, everyone needs a hug. Yeah, everyone needs a buddy to say, "Hey, I'm in the mud with you. Let mm -hmm. me just hear this out. Let me listen to you." Mm -hmm. Without me trying to solve your issues, without me trying to pass judgment, yeah. let me just sit in the mud with you and listen. You know what I love? I love like how you had this warrior in you, but like I didn't know about it until like you know, years later, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? But like, you were also like one of the first people who like welcomed me when I went to high school. I love like it. you were like one of the very first people who like, you know, like it was through football. Mm. You know what I mean? Like we created like a friendship and I just, I just remember like you were like one of my first friends Hell yeah, as Tyler. far as like who wasn't in my grade. Yeah. You know what I mean, people who I wasn't already with, you know what I mean? I appreciate that, man, because I've always, uh, I feel like that love that I didn't feel from, you know, the father figures in my life. I give all the thanks to my mom mm. because she just filled me with love and support and guidance, especially at the times I needed it. And I think without that kind of support and even her just leading by example, mm -hmm. acting so selflessly in many ways, you know, picking up additional part-time work to make sure me and my three sisters had the opportunities we did. Mm -hmm. That led me and kind of gave me this idea of like, all right, that's how I want to lead. That's how I want to mentor. That's how, if there's anyone younger than me or older than me, that's how I want to be seen mm -hmm. as somebody filled with love and giving love. Yeah, you know? I felt that. I appreciate that, man. I really did. I never wanted to be someone, and I'm still obviously not, but somebody that was viewed as, well, let's bring it back to the story. Somebody who says something negative that those people probably have forgotten. Right. But that fueled me for years. Right, right, right. You never want to be that person that just says something negative that, I mean, you'll forget tomorrow. Right. But that, those words that you chose right. stuck with that person. And it may not be as, as positive as me. It could be something that just drove somebody into a dark hole. Yeah. You just never know. Right. And so choosing our words so carefully mm -hmm. and thinking about, wow, like the magnitude of what we're saying to somebody. Yeah. 
is so important. Yeah. People will forget that, especially keyboard warrior and people that behind their phone saying, willing to say whatever they want. Right. But at face to face, it is rare somebody will actually say those mean things. You yeah. know? It's just unfortunate. Hurt people, hurt people. Yeah. That's a great way to put it. Hurt people, hurt people. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And they want to misplace their hurt onto others. Right. It's unfortunate. Right. And, you know, I'm always understanding of, you know, it is a dark place they just have to work through. It's not like somebody's like, oh, you're hurt forever, mm-hmm. you know, but it is just sad to see. It's it's very draining, you know, yeah. when you could see somebody hurt and maybe you reach out and like you said, try to give love, but maybe it's responded with, I'm going to pull you in too. And I'm going to try to just give this negative energy to you. And it may be subconscious. Yeah. But like you said, sometimes hurt people hurt others. And it, maybe it's not meant to in the moment. Um, I think back to many people in my life that may have hurt me in just like in those moments and they didn't mean to. Mm. But then again, they were hurt. Mm. They were dealing with things or weren't dealing with things yeah. that were troubling them. So amazing. So I just, yeah, I think filling, you know, your persona and just your day to day with so much love and gratitude is the only way of going about life. Yes. It's the only way because it is natural to face all of the negative emotions. It's the most too. sustainable. It is the most sustainable. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's the only way you can truly and organically grow into something that you want to be. Right. Right. Because those who are leading their lives by resentment and greed and just the fuel to um, be never content with what they have. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's, maybe it's not the salary. Maybe it's the title. Like, Oh, I just, I want that C suite position. That's what I want. Mm. Why do you want that? You know, having people just strive for something and it's just, it is upsetting mm-hmm. and you just hope more people can develop and find that love in life. But realistically, not everyone does. Yeah. So we just have to try to give love as much as we can. Absolutely. You know, to anyone, again, that may be looking for it, needing it. Right. Um, but just, especially the ones we care about. And like kind of going back into the those, like when we do our research about the mentality, like the mama mentality, mm. you know what I mean? People who are like warriors, yeah. like just focusing on that next step, you know what I mean? Being, being yeah. fully present. And like the goal itself is to just being, it's just to be able to continue the goal. Yeah. You know, continue, continue showing up every day. Like I mentioned this last podcast, the last podcast had so many correlations. We were talking about dreamers and like yes. all this other stuff. Yeah. But um, the like the best things can't be won. Like when mm. you're in a, when you're in a, when you're in a, like a marriage and a relationship, you can't win at marriage. You just it's it's continuing the marriage. Yeah. It's it's, it's sustaining that. It's the day in day out. Nah. You know what I mean? When you're when you're when you're growing your business, you can't necessarily win at business. It's being able to continue doing business. Absolutely. It's that type of thing. Being able to continue to keep on showing up in the gym. Being able to continue to do whatever makes you feel fulfilled. Yeah. That's the win. Yeah. You know. That's a great point, and I feel as though that those with a winner's mentality confuse that way of life. Whatever they want to do. Exactly. Like, no, there isn't always an outcome. There isn't actually like certain aspects of your life that you can win. Yeah. The winning is the sustainability in a relationship or with your family. The winning is falling in love with the process. Exactly. That's where most of your time is. Yeah. When you're out here practicing, when you're out here working towards, you know what I mean? Like, that's where your time is most spent. Yeah. And if you're fucking hating that moment, you're hating your life. You're hating your most like important moments yep. where most of your time is spent. Yeah. You know, like, that's... no, it's so true. Yeah. And it's true. And it's falling in love with the process. And for me, I've been able to kind of feel that through sport, which is great. And what I love about that process is, again, there are always moments along that journey. Yes, that may bring you a couple steps back, but you know, you're on the right path. Right. There is one I'll never forget. I was at King Philip Middle School. It's dead of winter in Connecticut. I think it was the bad winter storm like years ago. Um, it's like around 1030. So at that point it was just street lights at King Philip, you know, that was just around the parking lot. There was pickup basketball going on. And so there are some cars in the parking lot with about a foot of snow, maybe less than that. All I told myself, I was like, I just want like 50 shots. Just, I have a bag of balls, I have my stick. I've got my sweatpants, uh, turtled up, just pulled that goal under that street light. And just started taking some shots, shoveling a little spot just for me to get some balls down and see the grass. And as that pickup basketball game was finishing up, the guys are heading to their car. 
there's a group of three guys that you could hear their murmurs. Like one of them is like, bro, what, is, what, what the fuck? Like, what is he doing? But one of them looked at me and said, hey, bro, you're going to be something. That's sick. That was it for me, Tyler. Hmm. Again, those moments you feel. And I was like, whatever I'll be, I know I'm on the right path now. Hmm. So finishing up with just that energy, I'm just like, yeah, man. Yeah. It wasn't just you, Nick, believing in yourself. Somebody else is now recognizing your hard work. A complete stranger. Mm. And like we said, just giving compliments to complete strangers. You have no idea how that can impact somebody's day. Right. And that really gave me another momentous push. Like, all right, Nick, you are on the right path. I love that. And I'll never forget that moment. That guy probably forgot about it. Mm-hmm. That guy probably drove home, you know, got late night food and went to sleep. Mm-hmm. But for me, that was just another moment. Mm. And it was, yeah. That's Incredible. dope. Not yeah, a lot man. of people kind of get that. Yeah. And, but I, I think that's why it's so great to, for us to be able to show appreciation. Yes. You know? Agreed. Like through your work and, and what you've done and your transformation, Tyler, like seeing your like diligent effort in this transformation, mm-hmm. like, man, like that's why I wanted to jump on the podcast. Oh, it, because, it, because it's an effort that I can compare you know relate to yeah 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 i'm it, like almost fighting i was fighting for my life for a little while really yeah i was mm. like um i felt like i had it's funny to say now but like i felt like i had no control and even now i give my control to god so i don't have the control mm. so it's funny but like i feel so at peace yeah you know but like i i um definitely felt like a product of my environment i definitely felt like i had shackles on my mind i definitely felt like i i started to see myself as 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 like Ideas were put into my into my mind of my own self identity that wasn't mine, mm. you know. And I just started to live within those beliefs. And even now, I kind of still feel like those shackles sometimes. But nah, yeah, fighting for my life, a hundred percent. Wow, a hundred percent. I wanted to, cause I, I'm a dreamer. Yeah. Like I, I need to, like I want to accomplish my goals. Like yeah. I, I, like I have a a big freaking dream, you know. Like I would love to be on on camera you know what i mean just like acting and open up the world to perspective Mm. you know what i mean give people a little bit of insight give people a little bit of love give people a little bit of gratification you know what i mean some peace some peace yeah that's that's because i see like the media like i used to use the media as outlets to like to cope and to self-regulate i used like tv and fucking all this other bullshit but like you know being aware of stuff you realize it's not necessarily always working in your benefit like i feel like some mm. of the messages are very shallow very dumb and then we replicate them in high school and we think that these things are cool and it's yep. really fucking stupid yeah so i just wanted to open people up to real thought you know that's or i want to open up but at the end of the day at the same time through my through my through my journey i've gotten so much closer to god and i'm so thankful for that so like i know that god first of all nothing comes before god there's mm. nothing that I could achieve in this life that is going to be the end all be all. Mm. Like Yahshua, Jesus Christ, yeah. he he was the most perfect person, right? He died for us. And uh, what could I do like greater than him? You know what I mean? I know I didn't really like phrase it that well right now, but... But in terms of sacrifice. Not just like or, sacrifice, like, mm. like, like, the, like, so he, the point of all this, the way I see it is to get into heaven. Yeah. Right. Like we are to, to get into heaven. Um, and like, like him dying for us is a symbol of just like us being able to achieve infinite peace, infinite, like just infinite peace. Yeah. You know what I mean? In, in time wise and every way, in every which way you can imagine yeah. infinite peace. There's nothing that I can do that tops that. Not a single thing that I will ever do mm. that will ever top that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, so I, I'm not worried about what I do. You know what I mean? Like, I know I'm going to like die and I'm ready to, you know mm. what I mean? Like not in a way that like I'm, I'm going to hurt myself. Yeah. But like, I'm very excited about what happens after. Yeah. You know, because you can, you can say that with the sense of like, I'm leading my life this way where I know that if, if it's my time, it's right. my time, but I've done and I've led my life in the way I want to be. It's, it's like, I have a, it's like a fear and a love for death. Mm. You know what I mean? Like I'm scared of it. Like I, 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 but I also am am ready for it. You know, like I want to, and because of that, because I'm scared of it, I want to do the things that I've always wanted to do. Yeah. I want to do the things that I've always wanted to try. Like just try it. Just see if I can, see if I can or not. Yeah. But like at the same time, 
if it doesn't happen because i'm like i i get i i whatever's meant for me i let god speak through yeah you know what i mean like he he whatever he wants that's what i want you know what i mean so i have dreams sure but if god doesn't want them to happen then that's just the that's just the way it's supposed to be. Absolutely. You know what I mean? That's yeah. just that's just the way I see. It. I'm never gonna fight that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because he becomes he's he's before everything. But those steps were meant to happen. Let's say yeah. you had a dream that you thought you know you were following blah blah blah, but that was meant to happen. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I guess it's, it happened. It's, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a time. It happened. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah. I, but that's how I actually see the majority of injuries, um, unfortunately. I try to not look at it in a sense of uh, frustration with myself, um, but I always see it as like, well, this is supposed to happen. Um, I recently broke my foot and had two minor fractures. It was you know, through a pickup game. But the way I started reflecting on it and with my mom, as we talked about it, she, you know, we both decided, like, hey, maybe this is supposed to happen. Maybe you weren't supposed to play in that big tournament at the end of the at the end of the month because right. something bigger could have happened. Right. So looking at it more of like a serendipitous point of view than like, 100%. oh shit, I got hurt. Oh, damn, Nick. Like what? What happened? Why would that happen? One hundred percent. So again, just no negativity. Right. Just keep that love and appreciation for myself. Not be hard on myself. Right. I can be upset. Yeah, right. it happens. But let's focus on. What, what are the next steps? Exactly. Like, I've done quite a bit of research as far as, like, successful mindsets before I even got closer to God. So, mm. like, I understand how the world um, or how successful people will rationalize situations. Yeah. Right? And those who are successful, they take responsibility for everything. Mm. Even the bad shit that happens to you. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, you got to take responsibility for that. And then also tying into what Yashua said, yeah. what do you add a single moment to your life from worrying? You don't. You know what I mean? Mm. Worry will not add a single second to your life. So there's no point in worrying. You know what I mean? So first take responsibility, but be at peace with now, like what whatever happens. It's just like that constant peace. Yeah. Worrying. Remember, all we have is this moment, you know? So if you're if you're if you're hating the process, you're hating this moment, you're hating yourself. You're hating that life. You're experience that's that's your life. Your life is hate. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Is that what you want? You know? So mm. no matter how bad shit gets, live with that peace. Yeah. Live with that peace because you only have now. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. And accept those emotions as they come. But like you said, we only have that moment. Right. right. And, and people try to confuse things. People think peace is docile. Peace is not docile. Those mm. two different fucking words. Docile mm. means docile. Peace means peace. Tenacity means tenacity. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you, you can have tenacity and peace at the same time. Yeah. Just because you're peaceful doesn't mean you're not doing anything. These yeah. are completely different words. Yeah, absolutely. You know what I mean? Just like how when you were internalizing this anger to, to, to no one witnessed it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you can have peace inside. No one no one understands and you're going through and working people mm. are always going to like con- you know try to say how you're feeling or whatever mechanisms are at play, but like internally, you know what I mean? It's just yeah. a different device. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm. It's like that's that's what how I try to it's like these positive emotions they're so much more sustainable. You know what yeah. I mean? Because you don't make rash decisions if you're operating off patience, if you're operating off gratitude. You know what I mean? Like you won't like make a shoddy deal because you need it right now. Exactly. You know what I mean? And it's incredible. Yeah, you become so much more optimal and just successful. I, that's frankly that's what I found. You have to be operating on these emotions because any other way, you may find some success, you may actually sustain some wealth. But is it true? Is it sustainable? Like you said, mm. you know, the way yeah. I see it. Your heart is all about your success. You know what I mean. If you're, if you mm. have that heart, if you have a good heart, yeah. You know what I mean. Because as we as we mentioned, we could die today. Yeah. You know. So if I have a good heart, if I'm exuding that heart, then I'm already successful. I feel like just being alive, being a human, being able to just say hello and change someone's life, that makes me successful. You know what I mean? Like I feel like I'm already a beautiful person. I feel like everyone is a beautiful person. We have the power. You have the power to save someone's life by saying hello. How are you not remarkable? We are all mm. successful. You know well what I said. mean? Yeah. Like, so we're all special. People just got to, you know what I mean? Like, that's. Yeah, that's, people have to see that in themselves first. Right. You, know, you have to see yourself as a special um, human being, you know, like somebody that provides value to the world and has that opportunity and has that kind of superpower. Literally. To, to change somebody's life just through their words or an action. Exactly. You know, an, an act of service goes so many, it goes so much farther than, you know, what you may say to somebody. Right. So instead of saying, hey, I love you, let me show you I love you or appreciate you. Every life is so important. Every life is not to be discredited. If you are 100 years old, you're 90 years old, you're 100 years old, you're 102, and you feel like you've lived a shitty life, you've been shitty to people, 
You know how much knowledge you have? You know how much knowledge I've learned for how to treat my children when I have them because I had a shitty like father figure, yeah. multiple father figures? Because of those shitty experiences, I know what not to do. Yeah. I know. So even if you feel like you've, you've, you've lived a life of regret and all this like upset, you have so much information to share. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's so valuable for people. That is so valuable. And I thank you for have going through that struggle. Yeah. I know it could mm -hmm. not, you know what I mean? It could not have been easy, but sharing that. Yeah. There's so much to learn from everyone. Well, and that's I, I love that you said that too, because that's exactly how I see my father figures in my life. Is that again leaving past that resentment, but now thanking them for showing me exactly what not to do. Right. Showing me exactly how not to be there for a son. Right. Or, or a daughter. Right. And that's what's taking me through my life's work and mission now is to work with kids. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whether I've found, you know, success in coaching uh, or working in elementary or middle schools, it is I get that fulfillment when I see a kid mm -hmm. at the beginning of the year compared to the end of the year and how much they've changed. You know, I could have all the great feedback from my staff or manager saying, hey, you're doing a great job. No, no, no. I get the feedback from when I see a child look at me and say, hey, thank you, Mr. Black. Oh, like I don't I don't need you anymore because I, I know I get it. I need a behavior expert or because I was yelling and cussing in the middle of class. Now I'm graduating with honors. Hmm. You know, I'll never forget a moment during that volunteer year where I had two twin boys who were 15 years old in eighth grade. Almost 16. Oh, my gosh. And, and they're held back multiple years. They were two twins and a towering 6'2 in eighth grade. <laughs> that and two other children in my after school program, when we had to focus on work for an hour and a half before getting into anything fun, those moments in those first beginning you know, mo months of that school year, whether threatening my life or they're saying, oh, Mr. Black, like, I know certain people. I'll, we'll take you out. Like threats, turning into the end of the year, embracing me and hugging me and saying, we are so happy you are in our life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those first couple months were fucking difficult. Mm -hmm. yeah. dealing, d dealing with a physical presence from two kids that are, uh, talk about needed some love. Mm -hmm. That just were so fueled and confused by their anger that all I needed was for them to trust me. And one of my favorite quotes, especially relating to kids, is the greatest gift you can give a child is your time. So for those kids, all I needed them to understand and trust me is that I will be there for you. Yeah, I'm going to be there to push you to do your history homework, but I'm also going to be there for before school when you have to tell me about your brother who was just you know killed yesterday and you need someone to talk to. I'll be there for you in a moment where you don't know if you want to go to high school or not. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about you feeling insufficient in this world because you've been told that you're less than. Let's talk about that. And trust me, I will be there for you. So those moments with those middle school kids and even second grade kids, you know, I had similar moments with those elementary kids because at such a young age and you have family members pass, you have things happen, you have family members arrested. It's hard to process that. Mm -hmm. Even at that age, just trusting me. Hey, I'll be there for you. Yeah, come on. Come here. Let's go chat. Those moments, I knew exactly how to handle those because my dad's never could. Mm -hmm. And I was so prepared to take on that year and any moment between with those kids because I was like, yeah, I went through this. I went through the moments in life where I just wanted an adult, especially a male figure, to just listen to me or give me some advice they never had it hmm. so that's what i really loved about that volunteer and it's it, again it's my life's work to just work and coach kids I, I find coaching kids through the avenue of lacrosse it kind of intertwines my passion and my work that i am so driven by but i just want to be a mentor for any kid like anyone that looks at me and says yeah dude like do you mind like do you have a couple minutes to talk yeah, absolutely. Because more kids need that. Especially young boys. There are, so, there are so many that are missing. They may have father figures in their life. Are they the ones that are the best for them? You know, some fathers can't, you know, choose their situation. Yeah. 
but and then there are some that just don't know how to be fathers yeah they they do their best but they just don't know how to be the right father either so wherever that child could then experience another role model male or female in their life is is so crucial to show them the right way you know but just like you said for us to see both sides things not to do versus what we should do you know it's um yeah, it's incredible, man. I've had so many moments with kids that I've, I've seen and, and have felt that appreciation. Um, that it, it really just pushes me every day. Because individually, I know that I can only compete in lacrosse at a high level for so long. Our bodies break down. At some point, we just can't play at a high level. But what I have gathered is that in the last 12 years... I have gone through so many experiences and gone through so many ups and downs and have been on this individual journey to getting to the highest level in this sport that I just want to share those experiences now and just tell kids like, yeah, you can do it. Maybe it's not sport. Maybe it's arts or music or dance, whatever it is. You can do it. There's no too late of a time to start. There's no... You need the guidance and support from your family to, you know, see that dream too. No, you have to see it. You have to want something. Fucking go get it. And I think it really, a lot of kids, a lot of adults need someone to just look them in the eyes and say that. Mm -hmm. There's no other way. One quote I have been obsessed with in the last couple, I mean, living rent free in my head, Tyler, is the magic you are looking for is in the work you're avoiding. Ooh, yeah. Ooh, bro. The magic you're looking for is in the work you're avoiding. That's it. And so many people are wow. delusionally driven like, oh, yeah, I want that. Right. You know, I coach so many kids who are like, coach, I can play Division One lacrosse. Hmm. <laughs> let me put in that work. Let me see what work you're doing. I know what it takes. I know what it takes to wake up at 5 a.m. every day and to play lacrosse at the end of the day. No, I never got to Division One level, but fuck, I know what it takes. You know, and I think a lot of people need that reality check. A lot of people need to, hey, oh, you want this? Let, give me a history. Let me see the receipts. Mm. Let me see the work. Yeah, you've done. Right, right. right. Oh, you tell me you, hit to, you went to the gym. What did you do in the gym? Did you dick around and sit on bench for fifty minutes, or did you have an intense workout that are it's around a structured routine that you were following your progression every week? Like, those are the little things, and that's applicable to anything, you know? And I just think, I, you know, for my friends, family, especially for myself, I just have to continuously ask myself, if I want something that bad, all right, let, let me look at my history. Let's see what I've been doing to get mm. to this point. Right. You know? Right. I, I recently was, uh, I made the Team Mexico 30-man roster playing in the World Games next year. And honestly, I wasn't shocked. Because it's been a dedicated effort of preparation and confidence building. I had no other thought going into that thing. I couldn't not make this team. Because, again, I had the receipts. I had the history of years, of years of dedicated work to this. Hmm. You couldn't tell me otherwise. And I felt the magic that I've been looking for, you know? I felt the magic from my hard work and success. And, you know, I always just ask people and, and, you know, push them to ask themselves that, you know. The magic you are looking for, just look at that work, you know. See what it takes. Ask people what it takes. That also was something big for me. I had to ask pro guys, like, what does it really take to get to that level? Oh, I need to spend an extra hour in the gym to focus on mobility and stick work? Roger that. Oh, I need to not focus on coaching so I can put more time into training and going through extra sessions day to day for myself. Makes sense. That's what it takes. Oh, it takes not hanging out with your buddies or going to that concert or spending hundreds of dollars on a bar tab where you wake up the next morning hungover and debating if you want to go to the gym. I get it. Copy that. Like, I'm there. And, you know, I think that takes some humility, too, with people. You have to be humble enough to ask people those questions. You know, 
something I loved about Kobe because it was something that he took after his basketball career going into business and any sort of endeavor. He never felt dumb about asking any question because for him, he didn't know the information he needs to know. He never felt hesitant to ask, you know, Richard Branson a, a business type question that may be so simple because he's dedicated to that. And he sees no other internal, like, kind of uh, self-reflection that's negative. Like, oh, this is a dumb question. No, I want to know the answer because I'm passionate about this. And I love that, you know? Mm-hmm. Something that I've loved with, with coaching kids. And I've always found certain kids were more dedicated to the game and in their craft, not from what they said to me, like, yeah, coach, I want to play here. This, I love the game so much, but from their actions. And, like, I see it, you know? I see, like, you see kids internalize, maybe, like, they get a shot wrong or something in a drill wrong. I look at their reaction and just, like, I'm looking in their eyes. Like, how are they processing that? Are they down on themselves? Are they hitting their stick on the, on the turf? Or are they just processing it and thinking, that's what I need to change? Minor tweak. And that's what I love about coaching. I love the intricacies of developing yourself that, that you find through sport, especially in, in you know, especially weightlifting, uh, lacrosse, any team sport. But I think it's those moments through training and the journey where you really develop yourself. That is it. It's not the wins. Those, that's just the, the success of your hard work, you know? Playing, even the idea of playing in games, is, that's a reward for your hard work. That's not where you're looking, you know? It's all those little moments. Like, I'm sure you found that throughout your transformation. Every time you work out or you see a bit of progress, it could be 1%. Oh, I'm on the right path. That's it. I'm falling in love with that moment. And that's, that's a huge drive. I just wish everyone has that. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Hundred percent. I mean, I definitely feel like I need a lot more discipline and dedication. Mm. Like you, you, you show like this discipline and dedication that is just uh, it's inspiring. And you know, I wish, honestly, man, I wish I had that level of dedication in all aspects of my life. And and be transparent, I don't. There are a lot of things that I know I need to work on and that I'm so aware of, but I know that I'm not dedicating that same amount of passion as I do to lacrosse. But it's, it does start with me just self-reflecting and understanding that. And, you know, somebody once told me it's, it's sort of putting water into the flowering pots of your priorities. You know, if I'm putting too much water in lacrosse or that specific pot, everything else is sacrificing, not getting enough water. Everything has to be balanced. And it, me being 30 and being at this point, that's really what I'm focused on now is having a complete balance in all aspects of my life. So relationships, family, um, even just being a person outside of a sport, you know, just being more than an athlete is super important to me. So, you know, doing things I love, like going to museums, you know, continuously learning. Um, I love science and I've always been a science driven mind. And so now balancing all of that, I think I've now realized it gives me a different perspective to the game too, which I really appreciate. So not all it's filled now with more love and gratitude because there was just so much animosity, it was deteriorating, but now I realize the rest of the aspects of my life are filled with love too. I just play the game with pure love and fun. Mm -hmm. And that is also something that you could be a dedicated, fierce competitor, no matter who you are in any sport or, you know, but you can always still operate with love. You can always lead with love and joy and passion and fun. So, yeah, man. That was well put. Thanks, bro. Appreciate it. Beautiful. So, I think we're going to wrap up this episode. That was Nick Black, an amazing individual, an inspiring individual, a warrior to his core. If you want to learn, please give him a follow. Check out his socials. We'll link them in the, in, the, uh, in the description down below. Send him a DM if you have any questions. If you want to like learn how to get started to build this discipline, get in contact with him. I'm sure he'll be more than happy to help you guys. Absolutely. Guys, this was definitely food for thought i'm i'm so excited that we reconnected you know absolutely I mean? like, man this yeah. was this was really i love this yeah Tyler, this was a huge opportunity and again i've loved the podcast and i'm 
I'd love to be back on. You Absolutely. Know, to have this keep growing, man. And, you know, I feel as though we have so many connections in this, in this yeah. idea of operating with love and loving the process that, you know, like-minded people need to stick together. 100%. You know, and, set, and, and surrounding yourself with like-minded people and being able to filter through those friends and close ones, no right. matter how difficult it is, you have to surround yourself with those like-minded people. This is huge. Yeah. Thanks, man. Dude, I'm fucking amped.